impossible things doing this morning. For those that weren't here last week, I shared a message and I believe we're going into a season where the impossible becomes possible. And if you didn't hear it or didn't, weren't here, I encourage you to get hold of our app or it's on YouTube as well, it is. YouTube and app. It's on the YouTube, it's on our app. I really believe it's a significant season that we're going to go into. We've gone through a season of asking for revival and that's not going to stop because revival is preceded by repentant people. And a people whose hearts are turned towards the Father and our hearts are turned towards the lost. Those that don't know Jesus, revival is always preceded by a hungry people. So we're not going to stop hungry. We're not going to stop asking. We're not going to stop knocking. We're not going to stop thirsting because we do want more of him. Because when his presence comes in like a flood, that which we've been struggling with for years changes in an instance. And it's only in his presence. There's nothing else. I can't teach you out of your bad habits. I can't preach you out of your bad habits. But when you encounter his presence... When you come into his presence, you'll never be the same. That's what it is about. It's about his presence. It's about ushering his presence in. And then it goes further. It's about how we steward it. Because we should be, right now, 2,000 years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we should be living in absolute glory. He said that I go that there might be a helper who's the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes and falls on the righteous and unrighteous, we've had 2,000 years to practice this. <laughs> Only 2,000. 2,000 a bit. But the reality is, we, we should be living in His glory. And we should be stewarding His presence. And the moment, like David, the moment that David encountered sin, his first cry was, God, do not take your presence away from me. The moment that we sense his glory or his presence has departed from us, there should be something that triggers inside of us, say, God, what have I done wrong? I need to repent and return so that I can experience that freshness, that I can experience that nearness, nearness, and I can enjoy your presence continually. Because living in that place It's like a well-oiled machine. It functions properly. When we decide to go from oil to striving and, and complaining and grumbling and all those other things, it's like grit and sand gets into the cogs. And if you ask any mechanic in this house, and that's not me, ask any other mechanic, when when grime and grit and sand get into the cogs, The machine don't go not so well. And what happens is the machine begins to grind. The machine begins to kind of break from the inside out. Until one day you push that starter motor and the thing goes... <laughs> Why? Because we've allowed grit and sand and nonsense into our engine, which is our heart. Instead of allowing his presence to permeate, fill it to overflowing and living out of that place. So this morning we're going to do some Bible gymnastics again. I started you early last week. We started doing some gymnastics, and it's always good to get into the Word of God. It's always good to understand what the Word of God says, and it's always good to understand what to do in season. Amen? So turn with me to 2 Kings. Okay, let's just take all these other pieces of paper out here. Let's find my Bible. 2 Kings, chapter 5. Oops, it's on this way around. 2 Kings, chapter 5. I'm going to read some portions of Scripture for you, and then I wanted to share with you a little bit about two words this morning. (laughs) God help me. 2 Kings, chapter 5. It says, Now Naaman... Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. It's possible. Jump with me to verse 9. It says, Then Naaman 
went with his horses and chariots and he stood at the door of Elisha's house because they had heard that Elisha was in town, which was the prophet. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go, because Naaman wanted to be healed from leprosy. And Naaman went with his horses and chariot and stood at the door of Elisha's house and Elisha sent a messenger to him. Challenge number one. We often want to see the man and we get a messenger. <laughs> Just saying. And the messenger said, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became exceedingly joyous at this instruction. It was exciting news on how to be healed. Now it says, No, but Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Sometimes our expectations don't match God's expectations, right? Are not the Abana and the Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, my father, if the prophet has told you to do something great which you have not done it, how much more then when he says, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of child, of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God and, and all his aides and came and stood before him and said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. Turn to your left to 1 Kings chapter 18. I promise you, like last week, this will all make sense. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat and drink, for there is the sound of the abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. He bowed his head on the ground and put his face between his knees and he said to his servant, go up now and look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, for those that don't know the story, Elijah had proclaimed, Elijah had proclaimed a drought over uh, the whole of the land and there was this time now where he's proclaiming that the drought was going to end. And so he said to his servant, go up and look if there's nothing. So go up now, look toward the sea. So the servant went up and said, there is nothing. And seven times he said, go again. Then it came to pass on the seventh time, he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's head rising out of the sea. So he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariots, go down before the rain stops you. Turn with me to John chapter 5. Whew. What on earth have these stories got to do with each other? I'll tell you in a moment. John chapter 5 verse 1. And there was a great feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and there he is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate of a pool, which in Hebrew is called Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time in the pool, stirred up the water, then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man had been there, with an infirmity for 38 years. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. This is going to be a lot of fun, I promise you. You guys ready? Matthew chapter 9, verse 20. It says, And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched him the garment, for she had said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. Turn to your right, Matthew chapter 26. <laughs> you guys with me? I told you I'm teaching you a Bible this morning. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. And then Jesus came with him to a place called Geth Geth Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter, two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further, fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. 
nevertheless, not your will, but, sorry, not my will, but your will be done. Then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he did this a couple of times. And then I just want to paraphrase two mighty men in the Bible, Abraham. Abraham received the province promise at 75 years old that he would have a son. It took another 25 years before that promise was fulfilled. Joseph was a young man of 17 years old. Any 17-year-olds in the house? Close? Oh, we've got a 17-year-old. So Joseph was that age when he dreamt a dream, shared it with his brothers, and his brothers sent him on a journey. It took 20 years for the fulfillment of that dream. And this morning, after sharing with you last week about the impossible becoming possible, I want to share two words with you that I believe are are very necessary character traits that we're going to have to have within the season that we're going into. And it's these two little swear words. No, they're not swear words. They're, They're beautiful words. It's the words persistent and perseverant. Persistent, persistence, and perseverance are going to be two character traits that we're going to have to develop in our lives for the season that we're busy going into. And the reason why I say that, because like we said last week, the impossible becoming possible, sometimes we have the dream at 17 years old. And in the society and culture that we live in, we want to push the little, it's done button. And not go through the 20 years of fun. Not go through the 25 years of waiting. (laughs) Not go through the 38 years of lying by a pool. How many of you would have given up a long time ago from lying by the pool of Bethesda for 38 years with infirmity? You guys would have probably had jumped up after one month and gone to find another pool. (laughs) You probably would have jumped up and gone to find another preacher. You probably would have gone down to the, the, the priest's house and said, there's something wrong, I can't get into the pool on time. Or the rabbi of the day. We so easily give up in the culture that we live in. We so easily don't persist till we see that which God has spoken over our lives to fulfillment because it's far easier giving up and going another route. Whoops. And I, I do love you guys, I promise you. But I believe that if we're going to see that which God's giving to us and busy giving to us, we're going to have to be very persistent and persevere until we see it happen. Even when things like some diseases come across our path, It didn't stop us from worshiping a king of kings. It didn't stop us from loving on him and adoring him. There are hard times coming, let me be honest with you. There are tough times coming. It's not me that's saying it, it's the Bible that says that, okay. But in it, Jesus says, I've overcome. And greater is he that lives in you than he that's in the world. No, Derry, you don't understand. I've been going at this for a week and I'm just not getting any results. Come on. Should I, should I, should I, should I show you what the world looks like? I'm going to pick on this one because I've just been through it, so I know it. How many of you like losing weight and getting fit? (laughs) I'm glad I got some laughs because how many of you have started something and given up after the week because you didn't see the results that you were expecting? Not, okay. So we're talking to the right people here. But that's our life. How many of you have gone into a job that the father provided for you and after a year you didn't like the boss so you left the job? 
Oops. Culture dictates that we should rather be comfortable than pursue the thing that is valuable. And there's been many words given to you, I believe. I believe that the Father is speaking to us. In you is dreams and passions and goals. And I know for some of you, you're starting to see some of the fulfillment of your dreams and it's been a long number of years. Yes? Yes? So what does this mean? So, it could, so pers- persistence is the ability to keep going. Perseverance is the ability to keep going despite facing difficulties and setbacks. We think of the story of Joseph. How many of you would still have a grudge against the brothers? <laughs> Thanks for the honesty. How many of you would have gotten mad at God the moment that you landed in the pit? Mm -mm -mm -mm. And it's the same today. We we have a, a dream. We get the direction from God and we start pursuing that direction and we face the first part of adversity. Oh, well, this can't be from God. I'm facing adversity. And so I I step out of that which God has for me because it's far easier doing things in the world than it is pursuing the things of God. Let me say that again. It's far easier doing the things of the world than it is pursuing the things of God. And we're coming into a season where we're going to get challenged more and more and we're going to have to be very persistent and very perseverant. In, in the life that God's given to us. Turn with me to James chapter 1. I told you the stories would all make sense. Sometimes you've got to do the seven times and go and wash in the things that you are challenged in. Sometimes you've got to go up the mountain seven times as well to see the, fir- to see the f- cloud as small as a fist. Why are you sleeping? Wake up. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all. (laughs) Okay, let's get us all on the same page here. My brethren and sistren, count it all. Joy, when you face, when you fall into various trials, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Desmond, your favorite scriptures here. Faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Count it all joy when you go through various trials, Because trials test your faith, which produces patience. Patience needs to have its time, which is to be that perfect work in you, so that you would become perfect and complete. Going through trials and tribulations actually is for your benefit. Let me say that again. Trials and tribulations is actually for your benefit. The thing that you've got to be confident in is your Father in heaven. It's far easier being confident knowing that you've heard from God and standing in His presence. That's why I said to you this morning, keep on asking, keep on knocking. Don't get complacent. Don't get satisfied saying you've had everything of Him. He's got so much more. When you're in that place of understanding Him and standing secure, going through a trial and tribulation, being confident that God will have your back, is far easier than going through a trial and tribulation thinking that you have to work it out. It's easy to be persistent. Elijah and Elisha, they knew who God was. They knew who Jesus was. And they gave the instruction. They let the word go. 
Jesus, we read in that story in John chapter 5, the 30, lying for 38 years. Jesus had one question for him, do you want to be well? 38 years. Imagine pursuing your dream for 38 years. Imagine being Abram. 75 years old. There's a promise. You'll be a father to many nations. 75 years old. See, there's lots of time for you guys at 75 years old. Pleasure. There's still dreams that the father can give you at 75 years old. Come on. Took another 25 years to see the fulfillment of that promise. Story of Joseph, 17 years old. I don't think our, t- our teenagers would last a couple of days, let alone 20 years. <laughs> Maybe they will, but the the world has become so impatient and the world has got so, given you so many outs, if I can put it that way. Jesus wants us to fight for that which he wants to give to us because it's precious. It's everlasting. It's secure in him. It comes with oil. When we take the out, it comes with sand. You guys are there still? Another scripture, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 says, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. So all of us right now should be very joyful and be full of glory. Isn't that right? He said, count it all joy when you go through tribulations. And here we've got glory because... In tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given. We're going to face tribulations. We're going to face trials. We're going to face the enemy head on. But like David, as he stood before Goliath, who are you to defy the armies of God? Who are you, O uncircumcised Philistine? And it's the same with us. Who are you, O trial and tribulation that you come against me? I'm going through this, and on the other side of it, I'm still going to be saying, I serve God, I love God, I've got His plans and purposes securely in my life, and I'm going to see it happen in my life. Even if I get thrown into prison, even if I get thrown into the pits, even if I get challenged and things get said wrongly about me. Come on. Because there's that happening at the moment where there's false accusations are coming against you. Well, having stand, do it. Stand. So how do we build persistence and perseverance into our life? How do we cultivate and develop these character traits? Number one, I've got seven points. Biblical. I've got five minutes. Wonderful. Number one, it's very short points, don't worry. Anchor yourself in God's promises. There's plenty of promises in this word of God. Plenty. What I do want to say to you this morning is when you go searching for promises, make sure that you've got the full story, not the half story that suits you. Give you an example. We were just sharing at men's. Well, Fadi was sharing men's on Tuesday, and I was there. Sometimes we only pick up half the promise. So, for example, just to give you the balance, because I believe the kingdom of God is always about tension. There's a father, a loving father, that wants to pour out his blessings that you cannot contain. Is one half of the story, because he's a loving father and he can do that any other time. But there's another half of the story, which is in the book of Proverbs, which says, if you don't put your hand to the plow, you will not eat. And so in Scripture, as you're going through Scripture and you're searching for these blessings and these promises that God has given to you, make sure you've got the full story. Because as I put my hand to the plow, He blesses me. 
There are times that he blesses me despite me putting my hand to the plow. But he's checking my heart out. And there are many other promises like that that are found in the word of God. If you go and study them, search them, seek them out for yourself and anchor yourself in those things because his word is secure. His word is a strong foundation. His word never fails. His word will always accomplish that which it has been sent forth to do. Anchor yourself in God's promises, not in your dreams and imaginations. Number two. Bless you. Cultivate a mindset of joy. (laughs) We haven't been baptized in lemon juice. We've been baptized into the joy of the Holy Spirit. Joy is not, a, is not determined by the circumstances and my surroundings. Joy is a condition and a state of my mind. Count it all joy. Thank you, Father, that you're taking me through these trials and tribulations. Thank you, Father, for the things that you're busy shaping and molding me through it. I don't like it. And you can say that to God. God's quite open. He's, a, he's not going to get offended by you being honest with him. Okay, let me just say that. He's in relationship with us, but don't get into that place of being a prune. Don't get into that habit of complaining and grumbling and moaning about it. Say, thank you, God, that you're taking me through this. Will you help me go through it so that I may learn that which you're trying to teach me? Because if we don't learn it, let me tell you something that's great about our God that we serve. He'll take you through it again. So if we don't learn it the first time, he'll take it through a second time, okay? Or the seventh time, or the 800th time, until you learn that story about what he's trying to teach you. Because he's got lots of patience, our God. Don't be like the Israelites. Don't die in the wilderness. Seeing the hand of God over your life, but never seeing the fulfillment of the promises that he has for you. Let me say that again. Don't be like the Israelites and die in the wilderness, seeing the hand of God on your life, but never seeing the promises fulfilled that were given to you. They were a generation that didn't get to see the promised lands because of their stubbornness, because of their disobedience, because of their lack of trust in a father that said, I will got you. I will take you into the promised land despite the giants, despite the fortified cities, despite everything else that you see with the natural eye. Trust God. Anchor yourself. If God has spoken and given you a word, anchor yourself in that word. Don't deviate from it. Don't turn to your left or to right, but say, God, thank you for the word that you've given me. I'm going to stand on it despite the desert. Despite maybe having to cross a river. Despite seeing the giants in the land that you're giving me. Despite the fortified cities. Despite being thrown into a pit despite me being cast out by my family, despite me not receiving a direct word from the pastor, and God speaks, anchor yourself in that. Okay, that's two. Three, persevere in prayer. Persevere in prayer. Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep talking to your heavenly Father. Persevere in that. Don't give up on that. Speak to Him. 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 If we're going to have a a, a lifestyle of being persistent and persevering, our prayer life is part of that. Number four, focus on the eternal perspective. Don't get caught up in the immediate or the right now. Keep your focus on the eternal perspective. If you look at the life of Joseph, Joseph never lost the dream that God gave to him. Even when he was thrown into the pit, even when he was accused 
by Potiphar's wife, even when he was in the prison, even when he was going through all that he had, he knew that God had a plan for him and he kept that perspective before him. Our eternal perspective is that we will be with him one day. Come on. That's our eternal perspective. And so when, fa- when facing trials and tribulations, it shouldn't be an issue because I know I'm going to be with him one day, but I also know that he's here with me right now in the trials and tribulations. Number five, draw strength from God's presence. Draw strength from God's presence. Spend time in his presence, just like you persevere with prayer. Make sure that you spend time in his presence and draw strength from that. Don't, <coughs> excuse me, don't draw strength from anything else because it leads to destruction. Number six, learn from your past experiences. Learn from your past experiences. I said God is patient and God will, if you haven't learned it the first time, he will take it through you again. If you keep doing the same things and expecting a different result, (laughs) number seven, rest in God. Rest in God's timing. I know that's a tough one. I know we all want to make things instant and happen very quickly. But rest in his timing. Why are you resting in his timing? Pray. Why are you, re- why are you waiting and resting in his timing? Worship him. Why are you resting in his time? Share your testimony. Why are you resting? Enjoy his presence. The moment that you begin to try and do God's job, there's a problem. The moment that you try and do things in your own strength, there's a problem. If you go and read through the book of Exodus as the Israelites, they conquered the the first and then they thought they could do it a second time in their own strength and they got wiped out. Wait on God. Press into Him. Keep asking, keep seeking while you're waiting for his timing to happen in your life. And let me tell you, most times if I ask people around you, when that timing actually happens, it's actually the best timing. For those who have had fulfilled promises and things that happen that God's promised you, and when it happens, it happens at the right moment. And I guarantee you, 100% of the time, he gets the glory. Because you look at that moment, you go, God, how on earth did you pull this off? (laughs) God, how on earth? Why now? I was just about to jump off the cliff because I've had enough. (laughs) God's timing is always perfect, and he always gets the glory. So in John chapter 16, as we end off this morning, John chapter 16, verse 33. West Coast Family Church, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Not in your own strength, not in your own doings, not in your own ways, but in Jesus you may have peace. In this world that you're living in right now. This world will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. Jesus says, I've overcome it. And so can you. And so I want to encourage us and I want to challenge us to develop these two things in your life. Being persistent, which means keep on keeping on, even when sometimes you don't receive the results. Keep on keeping on. Keep on doing good. Keep on loving on the Lord. Keep on enjoying his presence. Keep praying. Be persistent about it. And then be perseverant as well because there are going to be 
hardships along the way. There are going to be little things and obstacles that you're going to have to overcome. But through that, Jesus says, I've overcome it, so can you. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Some promises take 20 years. Some, some promises take 25 years. Some promises take 12 years. Some promises require you going seven times to dip in the Jordan. Sometimes promises take just going up seven times up the mountain because you know that's what God's told you to do. Anchor yourself in God's promises. Anchor yourself in God's word. Anchor your life in God's voice. As he speaks to you, he will direct your path and lead you into the abundance of what he has for you. So why don't you stand with me this morning? Grab the hand of the person next to you, why not? Don't grab it too hard, okay? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for just the opportunity once again just to spend time in your presence corporately and with each other and together. I thank you, Father, for this family. I thank you for what you're busy doing in this family. And Father, I also know that sometimes we get despondent and we get depressed because we're not seeing sometimes the results or the promises fulfilled that you've given to us. But Father, this morning I know that you're developing in us two characteristics, being persistent and pe being perseverant, keeping on asking, keeping on knocking until we see that day which you fulfill that promise. And so Father, I pray for us, not just as a family, but individually this morning. I thank you for all the promises. I thank you for the things that have been deposited into every person's life. Father, I pray that we won't give up, that we won't quit, that we won't step out of that which you've given to us and put before us. But Father, that we would continue to persist, we'd continue to persevere despite, Lord, sometimes the setbacks that we do face until we see the fulfillment of the word that you've spoken and given to us. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, also that you would just come in and pour your oil into each person's life in a far greater measure. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're at work in our lives, that you're busy helping us be shaped and molded into the image of Jesus. And Father, I pray for those that are maybe running low on oil, running dry, feeling like life's a little bit of a slog uphill. Right now, Holy Spirit, I just pray that your oil would just come and saturate those dry areas, be poured out into those areas, Lord, that need, Lord, refreshing, restoring, and reviving. And God, I pray also for those people maybe who've dropped the promises that you've given to them because it was too difficult. I pray for a determination and a resilience, Lord, to be birthed inside of their life right now. As you bring those promises to the forefront, as you remind them of the promises that have been given, I pray for a determination and a resilience like never before. So may he do exceedingly abundantly in your life this week. More than you've asked, more than you've imagined more than you've dreamt of. May you continue to press into his promises, keep on praying, and wait for his timing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.